Hello and welcome to the very first event in our new series of Professional Skills Masterclasses. And today we'll be focusing on how we can all be exceptionally productive. And we're joined by two very special guests who will share tangible tips and advice for how you can become more motivated, productive and effective. I'm Chris Sims, I'm the Managing Director of Commercial and Marketing here at BT. And as part of BT's Skills for Tomorrow programme, we've been helping thousands of people in organisations to develop their digital confidence and also develop their professional skills. And of course, now more than ever, due to COVID-19, these skills are critical for people and organisations to survive and eventually thrive. Before we get started, just a couple of notes on housekeeping. Firstly, throughout the event, you can pause and play the stream anytime you please. And secondly, we'd love for you to be part of the conversation. So we have a live Q&A area where you can post your questions, which I'll be putting to our panel of experts throughout the show. So let's start with a fact that I really think captures the challenge we have. And that is that despite all the advances we've made over the last 12 months in remote working, a recent study still shows that 82% of managers of remote employees are concerned about reduced productivity. So to explore this and more, joining us remotely, I'm very happy to introduce two special guests for today. We have firstly, Grace Marshall, head coach, chief encourager, productivity ninja, and best-selling author. Hi there, Grace. Hi, Chris. And secondly, we have our very own Nicola Millard, BT's principal innovation partner, who will be bringing her expertise in motivation and productivity. Hi, Nicola. Hey, Chris, how are you doing? Well, big warm welcome to you both today. Really looking to hear about what you've got to say. But let's start with a slightly different question. So, Nicola, I suppose actually we all have an idea about what being productive means, but do we need to think about productivity differently in a digital age? I think we do, to be honest, and, and we've done a lot of research around this because uh, we, we like to ask people what they want from digital for a start. So I think the first question is, what is digital um, and why do you want to do digital? And that, to be honest, that question we posed prior to the pandemic and during the pandemic, the answers were mostly the same. Um, and actually, when people want to, you know, digitize work, they've generally got three things in mind. One is the number one is absolutely let's improve productivity. The second one is improving customer experience. And the third one, which has shot up the top 10, oddly enough, in the in the past year, is to uh, ensure that remote working can be done. So I think in terms of that productivity piece, that's great. But as soon as you start to scratch the surface of productivity, you start to get um, a little bit of a challenge, I guess, because a lot of the productivity measures that we use were effectively derived back in the industrial era. Um, it was around factory optimization, this whole idea of tailorism, that there was a perfect way of doing things and you had input and you had output. And I think one of the struggles we've had in the digital age is that certainly when we look at the people that have successfully migrated to working remotely are knowledge workers. Now, I'm a knowledge worker, um, I don't produce widgets, so inputs and outputs. Maybe I can measure my output a little bit more easily than my input, but it's all a bit vague. Um, and I think that's one of the problems that we're often trying to, to use productivity measures in a very blunt way, but obviously using measures that were largely derived about 200 years ago to apply to today's work practices. So I think the first thing we need to do when we're looking at the digital workplace is to probably rethink what what we think productivity is. Um, and I'm not going to give you an answer because it's still a space that we're researching. But um, I think there are a few things that are becoming obvious around productivity. The first one is that well-being is intimately linked to it. So if, 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 you've got, if you want people to work well, they should be well. Um, and I think the pandemic has really, I guess, crystallized people's thoughts around well-being at work and making sure that employees are, are well to work. Um, so that's the first thing. And there are certain countries like Scotland, Iceland, New Zealand that are actually looking at productivity and well-being and trying to measure that. The second one is a slightly more innovative one. Uh, we work with MIT, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Certainly people like Michael Schrage at, at MIT have been 
saying, can we get a, an idea of return on ideas? Because if I'm a knowledge worker, actually my output is largely around ideas. Now, the data is probably there in the network somewhere, um, but how do we measure that? And I think, you know, that's the big question with productivity. What do we measure? And then how do we measure it? Um, and those are two very big questions. Well, thank you, Nicola. It seems there's a real change in what we mean by productivity and its definition. I mean, Grace, I assume you also think we really need to modernise what we mean by productivity. Absolutely. There's a, a great quote from Manoush Shafiq, who is the director of the London School of Economics, and she says that in the past, jobs were about muscles. Now they're about the brains, and in the future, they'll be about the heart. So in an age where work is about heart and minds, we need to think about productivity differently. It's not just about efficiency. It's not just about the quantity of our output. It's perhaps more valuable to think about the quality of our ideas, the quality of our thinking, uh, the quality of our relationships and our outcomes. I, I, I love that concept of hearts and minds because we're often obviously taught as managers. That's a great way to engage teams. But... I mean, over the last 12 months, it's been difficult to keep teams motivated. And I think many of us have found it difficult to keep ourselves motivated. I mean, Nicola, why is motivation so important? And importantly, how can we keep ourselves and our teams motivated? Yeah, we're getting into dangerous territory whenever we talk about motivation with me, because my PhD was on motivation. So I can I can basically bore for Britain on motivation. But um, I think motivation is one of those things that often is very badly understood. Um, so, I mean, it's incredibly important for productivity. If you want to look at the sort of formal definition of it, it's the psychological process that gives behavior purpose and direction. Um, I like to call it what gets you out of bed in the morning, to be perfectly honest. And a lot of my research was really to try and figure out what did get people out of bed in the morning. Um, and I think the other, the other problem we have with motivation is that it's often interpreted entirely around extrinsic motivators. So, you know, performance and reward and pay. Now, work is always going to be somewhat extrinsically motivated because frankly, we do get out of bed for salary, um, but that's not the only thing. And I think it's the intrinsic motivators that become much more fascinating. So that's really around, you know, do I have an interesting job? Um, do I enjoy the social connections that are developed within my job? Do I have control over my job? And that control piece, I think, is an interesting one and actually boils down I, a lot of my research identified a number of motivators, all of which mysteriously begin with the letter C. So the first one is culture. You know, how am I managed? Um, do I recognize that my purpose and the purpose of the organization align? The second thing is content. So simply, what do I do? Um, is my job actually an interesting job to do? Or maybe it's not interesting, but how do I find things that engage me about it? Um, control. How much discretion do I have in my job? And classic psychology will tell you that a job with high demand and low control will stress you. Um, and hence, we need to maybe we can't deal with the demand bit, but the control bit. You know, how much control can we give employees about their job? Because that will make them more motivated and less stressed. Collaboration, who I work with and the team dynamics. I think that's been an interesting one within the pandemic. And certainly we've seen direct teams get a lot stronger, those stronger ties within direct teams because we've been talking to each other more. What suffered is the weaker ties outside teams and they're important as well. And that's the bit that we may need to look at the physical office space for. And then the final one is curiosity. So uh, do I feel as if I'm discovering new things and learning on the job? The one I discounted was competition, which again, we often use um, because a lot of that's extrinsically motivated. Um, and it's not about points and prizes. Um, and work isn't a game, it's not a sport. And I think it's a very powerful motivator competition, but it can also uh, drive people away from doing things like collaboration. So I think we need to think it's a very powerful motivator competition, but we need to use it sparingly and carefully because otherwise we might wreck some of those other Cs. Great. And Grace, are those absolutely. themes familiar to you? Yeah, absolutely. I always say productivity is not just about getting stuff done. Um, you know, yes, ticking things off a to-do list is satisfying in the moment, but that's a fleeting satisfaction. Um, you know, productivity, sustained productivity comes a lot from not just how much we achieve, but actually what are we achieving? How are we doing that? So it's the whole work-life experience. And so that's where motivation, meaning, purpose plays a key part in that. 
Brilliant, brilliant. I love that. And I love the five C's, actually. Lots of themes there that I recognise. Um, Nicola, then, what would you say are your three best tips for anyone who wants to work more productively? OK, so the first big one is people often mistake activity with productivity. Um, it's often that 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 people go, how are you? How are you, how are you doing? Oh, I'm really busy um, because we value that busyness. And yet is busyness productive? I think that's one of the big things that we need to ask. And obviously there are things like multitasking uh, that we tend to think is um, a very productive way of working. We'll juggle lots of things. Now, the first thing is we don't really multitask. We time box and time slice. And actually the evidence from the research is that the, the more multitasking we do the less productive we get and the trouble is a lot of our devices now try and encourage us to multitask they're continuously demanding our attention like small children um so i would say you know don't just you know be busy um try and figure out what you know actually is productive in that busyness and do more of that and less of the stuff that's really around faffing about to be perfectly honest or, or simply trying to multitask infinitely or try and compensate for that by working longer hours and again longer hours does not equate to productivity in fact long hours cultures are usually less productive so don't mistake activity for productivity the second one uh, is i've stolen it from jason freed he, he he called it um beware the m and m's i've added an extra m so i'm going to say beware the m and m and m's which doesn't quite work so well but um but meetings managers and messaging or mail um so yeah Basically, meetings are a big one. Again, I look busy if I'm constantly in meetings and the pandemic has allowed us to time box those meetings in endless sessions of 30 to 60 minute boxes. I, I keep saying I, I tend to get up in the morning with an impending sense of Zoom these days. So um, again, we haven't questioned whether meetings are productive way of doing work. We just have lots of meetings because we're busy. So meetings, managers can be quite demanding. Uh, so again, how do we manage our managers to try and maybe not schedule quite so many meetings for a start? And then messaging mail, uh, simply they are often big interrupters. Um, so how do we minimise the interruptions that they have? Because again, we tend to multitask as a result of a lot of that stuff. Um, then uh, I think the, the big one at the moment is uh, re-establishing boundaries, um, particularly since our work lives and our home lives have kind of blurred during the pandemic. So some of us do feel as if we're living at work. And again, finding the off switch and just making the distinction as to when I'm working and when I'm not working is really important. So, I mean, there are lots of strategies to deal with that. I did some interviews very early in the pandemic with some of our really experienced veteran home workers who were doing a commute around their garden in the morning or people wearing their lanyard, their security pass when they're at work and taking it off, a symbolic taking off when they're off work. So it is really around defining when I'm at work and when I'm not at work. And that's often very difficult if we are juggling multiple demands on our lives. We end up with more with time confetti than a, a, a sort of block of time when I'm working and a block of time when I'm not. So I think that's difficult to manage. And often that's where a lot of the stresses are coming at the moment. Brilliant. Impending sense of Zoom. I love that. I will be stealing that quote. Um, obviously, Grace, you are a productivity ninja and an expert in this subject. So maybe you could just take a little bit of time to explore some of the areas that you think you could really help people unlock that additional productivity. Absolutely, I'd love to, Chris. And I think um, Nicholas set the uh, scene very well there. So when we think of industrial age productivity, what um, you know, we've already established that measuring productivity by outcomes is an outdated measure. Um, sorry, me measuring productivity by inputs is an outdated measure. But um, I think how we approach productivity also needs to be updated. So, for example, we talk a lot about time management. But actually, time management is useless. Um, there's nothing we can do to manage time, to make time go faster or last longer. We can't control time. And in fact, I would argue that time without attention is completely useless. And our attention is fragile. It's like an egg. It's really easily broken and really hard to put back together again. So they did um, an experiment at Microsoft back in 2004, actually, uh, where they had a bunch of people working on something that required a certain level of mental investment. So they were writing reports, designing software, fixing bugs in the code, and they interrupted them with one minute interruptions. So imagine somebody coming up to you saying, hey, have you got a minute? Or a one minute email, or a one minute phone call. 
And what they found was that even if genuinely the interruption only took a minute to deal with, it took on average 15 minutes to recover their attention and get back to the thing they were doing. So if you to imagine it takes 15 minutes to recover from a one minute interruption, it would only take four badly timed interruptions to suck up a whole hour of your day. And in fact, a more recent study in 2014 suggests that the recovery time from an interruption these days, it's more like 23 minutes and 15 seconds. So it would only take three um, badly timed interruptions to suck up a whole hour of your day. So what we need to do is manage our attention and not our time. And as Nicola mentioned, the three M's, you know, the M and M and M's are a huge um, source of distraction and interruption. So when I ask people who or what distracts you from getting things done, it's those things. So it's the emails, the messages, the pings, the pop-ups. As human beings, we are wired to respond to things that ping and pop up. So when you see that little pop-up in the corner, even if you go, no, 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 I don't want to look at it right now, it's already stolen a little bit of your attention. So one really quick win that we can do is to turn off those notifications. So the little notification that tells you you've got mail, the pop-up, the ping, turn it all off so that you can start doing emails when you choose, not when it happens to arrive. Because let's face it, email was never designed to be an emergency contact tool. We don't email the fire department when there's a fire, right? And then when it comes to meetings, what we tend to do is we see meetings as a demand rather than an invitation. So we tend to see it as, oh gosh, there's another meeting that's been added to my diary, another thing I need to go to. Perhaps we need to reclaim the invitation side of a meeting's invite. Maybe respond by asking, what is this meeting for? And what is it that you need from me? What's my contribution here? And maybe if I discover that five of us from the same department have been invited to give a 10 minute update, maybe only one of us needs to go. And maybe we only need to go for that 10 minute part of it and not for the whole two hours. So questioning why we're being asked to attend meetings and what our contribution is helps us to be more focused and bring our best contribution, but also maybe helps us to say no to some of those endless Zoom meetings. And then when it comes to our managers and our colleagues in general, actually, um, perhaps we need to manage our availability because if we're always available to everybody, we're never really fully available to anybody. So maybe there needs to be time when we are um, maybe going dark. So in Productivity Ninja terms, we call this stealth and camouflage. Times when we're slightly less available, where maybe we go dark, we turn our Wi-Fi off, we turn um, you know, our emails off, we go on to work offline mode, which there is on Outlook, there is a work offline mode. Um, or maybe we just turn our Teams meeting status to do not disturb. And what that means is that we get a small window of uninterrupted time where we can really focus and get our head down and get really good work done. And then when we're fully available again, you know, when we're in contact with other people, we can give them our full attention instead of being divided between the two. And of course, the fourth thing that Nicola mentioned, another M is multitasking. And multitasking absolutely doesn't work. You know, we make the work harder, we make the work more stressful. We also are far more likely to make mistakes and the work takes longer when we're multitasking. So let's go for serial monotasking rather than multitasking. Do one thing to a sensible level of completion, then move on to the next thing. And if anybody's thinking, that's great, but I've got so much to do. How do I get everything done if I can't multitask? My answer to that is stop trying to do everything. Because we kind of know that we can't get to the end of everything, right? But if we think that everything is holy grail, then we think that surely the more stuff I'm doing, the more productive I'm going to be, right? But actually, it comes a point where more becomes less. When there is too much going on, we end up spreading ourselves thin, diluting our impact, getting so overwhelmed that we can't focus on anything. When there are too many emails in the inbox, it all becomes noise. When there are too many meetings in the diary, when's the actual work going to get done? So actually what's stopping a lot of us from being productive isn't that we're not doing enough, it's that we're trying to do too much. And when we do that, we end up aiming for quantity rather than quality. We end up pursuing that sense of busyness and activity that Nicola talked about, rather than uh, quality and impact and results. So what we need to do is discern between the real work that's actually gonna take us forward towards the goals that we wanna achieve and the fake work that just keeps us busy. And believe me, there is plenty of fake work to keep us all busy. The other thing we need to do there is also start to think about culturally. Yeah, who do we reward? 
Do we reward the person who looks the busiest, who responds the quickest to emails, who stays the latest and works extra hours? Um, or do we reward the people who are maybe looking for ways to get better results, um, looking for ways to bring fresh thinking and creativity and ideas and innovation and getting that outcome and getting, you know, creating value rather than necessarily creating more work for each other? And then the final thing that I will say is that we need to set clear finish lines. So Nicola mentioned that sense of work-life blur, where am I working from home or am I just living at work? And the fact is that we live and work in an age where work never ends. So then it's up to us to put in place some of those finish lines. We need to start deciding what does done look like for today or for the week? What does done look like on this task or this project? It's up to us to define those clear finish lines. Because otherwise, if we just throw more hours at it, what we find is there are two things. Parkinson's law means that work expands to fill the time available. So if you give it more time, guess what? It just takes more time. And then there's also the law of diminishing returns. So the more hours that you throw at something, eventually the less value those extra hours will add. And so if you find that you're just trying to work harder, trying to work longer hours, um, and it's not getting the results that you want, maybe what we need to do is to set those clear finish lines, but also make sure that we take breaks and make sure that we actually take time away from the work. Sometimes the most productive thing we can do is to stop working, take a break and come back fresh. And we'll find that's when we can make clearer decisions because if we don't take breaks, we get what's called decision fatigue where our ability to make good judgment decisions deteriorates um, with every decision that we make. So it's a limited resource. But also when we don't take breaks, we don't get the benefit of some of the creative thinking um, that comes from looking away and thinking about something else for a time. And also there's the matter of our well-being as well, because as Nicola said, well-being and productivity go hand in hand. And quite often we see well-being or recharge as a bit of a luxury that we'll get around to when everything else is done. And guess what? That's when it doesn't happen. That's when it always falls off the list because things don't get finished. Yeah, there's always more work to be done. So what we need to do is start to see well-being as our fuel for productivity. To see that when we switch off, that we fully switch off when we actually, rather than going on standby, waiting to go back to work again, actively pursue something that recharges you that energizes you so that you can come back fresh, ready to do your best thinking, do your best work and bring your best ideas to the table. Uh, so yeah, set those clear finish lines and that's where I'm going to finish too, Chris. Oh, brilliant. I mean, wow, that was a whole host of useful uh, insight there. And I could see uh, Nicola sort of sh nodding ahead manically as well. Mm -hmm. So thanks very much for that. And I have to say, I turned notifications off on my phone at the beginning of the pandemic because Frankly, it was stressing me out a bit and it has made a huge difference. So great tips. Thanks. Thanks, Grayson. And thanks, Nicola. So we've had a few questions from our audience and we're going to take a look at those. So firstly, we have a brilliant question from Heidi, who's uh, interested to hear from you, Nicola, actually, on how digital can be used to gauge productivity. So the actual question is, what are the panel's thoughts on using AI to focus on areas for performance improvement. So, Nicola. Yeah, well, AI is an interesting one. So first thing is that AI does need distinctive inputs and outputs. So uh, AI doesn't work by magic, it works by data. So it needs data in order to figure out whether we're productive or not. But ironically, uh, we can probably measure inputs quite easily, to be perfectly honest. If you look at some of the stuff, for example, that Microsoft have done with their productivity tools, I can figure out how many meetings I've had and who those meetings are with, but actually the outputs of those meetings, um, what happened? I mean, it's very difficult to get that data. So, you know, I think you can use AI to maybe manage things for you, but we're all different. And I think you need to train it in order to maybe look at some of the bad habits that we have, and maybe it could nudge us in that way. But AI is also an interesting one that almost compounds the problem, because if you look at AI as a whole, what it tends to take away is the measurable transactional rules-based process-based stuff. So all the things that we're, are easily measured, AI does. That means that eventually we get, we're human, we, we love mess and complexity and innovation and creativity. All of those things are far, far harder to measure. Does that mean that we are of no value? 
Uh, no, because actually the human brain is an incredible thing. I mean, around the social connections we make, the ideas we have, very difficult to measure, but absolutely valuable. But it does look from traditional productivity standpoint but, uh, point that AI is very productive. But is it? Um, so I think AI, it's an interesting one. If it's got the data, it might be useful, but actually it could also add to this problem around how do we measure the human in terms of productivity and do we need to think of very different measures? Great, thanks, Nicola. And our second question is from Georgia. And Georgia's asking, how can we use technology in the workplace to improve productivity? And I think crucially, uh, can technology sometimes be a hindrance? And I think I'll, I'll ask Grace this one. Absolutely. It's so interesting that often people will ask me, one of the first questions they'll ask me is like, what tech should I be investing in? What tool should I use to help me to be more productive? And the answer I give them is that it's always about psychology before technology, because the tool is only ever as good as the person who's using it. And so what we need to do is think about how do we want to use this tool? Um, and then what are the expectations we want to set around that? So, for example, technology has enabled us now to communicate instantly with each other. So we had email before, but now we have um, instant messaging in Teams and in Slack and things like that. So how do we use that well as a way to communicate and collaborate rather than just something that creates that distraction and that interruption factor that we talked about earlier? A lot of this comes from thinking about what's the purpose of this? What channel do we want to use for what kind of communications? And then setting some ground rules. What kind of um, expectation do we have? If you send me an email, how long do I have before I respond um, so that I don't have to be looking at it all the time so I don't have to have those notifications turned on? So having those rules of engagement around how do we use our tools and what do we want to use it for is a much better way of using our technology well rather than just going, yeah, let's just add another piece of technology to the mix. Brilliant. And Nicola, I'd love to get your response too because I know this is a subject close to your heart. Oh, definitely. I mean, I think um, there are a few things. I think people assume that everyone can pick up technology and use it effectively because it's easy. It's not. And I think we assume a level of tech technical literacy maybe that people don't have. So I would say, you know, firstly, explain what the technologies are for and how people can use them more effectively. I think the other thing that we've been looking at a, a lot, particularly with Cambridge University and Lancaster University, is this problem with you know, being always on. So, um, you know, that pressure to always be available. And, and as Grace said, there's a lot of things that we can do to maybe alleviate that pressure that is created effectively by the technology connecting us uh, uh, constantly rather than enabling us to disconnect. So, so yeah, I think um, that, that pressure to be always on is, is, is a psychological pressure more than a reality, but it's enabled by the technology. How do we find the off switch is the big question. Great. Thank you, Nicola. And thanks to both of you, actually. It's been really great advice for everyone watching today. So what a fantastic masterclass on being exceptionally productive. And I've definitely learned a few tips myself, uh, particularly cognizant now of Parkinson's law. Uh, very relevant to me, actually, because I am terrible at time boxing my day. But we've learned a lot of other things as well. So we've learned how not to mistake activity for productivity. Uh, we've learned that multitasking and long hours might look productive, and I, actually, I think we probably all know this, it probably isn't as productive as we think. We've learned about the M and M and M's, the third M, meetings, managers, and mail, that are the root causes of so many interruptions in our working day, and they cause us to multitask and actually cause us to work longer. We've looked at re-establishing boundaries, setting clear finish lines, and actually avoiding that work-life blur. And actually, Grace made a really good point that you need to recharge to fuel your productivity. And we've learned to manage attention and not time. And time without attention is useless, as, as many of us will know as they're playing with the kids and sneakily looking at their phone at the same time. And finally, we've learned to stop trying to get everything done because we know, really, we can't. So I really hope you've enjoyed today's masterclass on how to be exceptionally productive. Uh, if we get the technology right, there'll be a couple of questions at the side of your screen, and I'd love you to take the time to answer those for us today. Uh, if you did enjoy today, please do join us for our second event on the 22nd of April, where we'll be talking to Sahar Hashimi, who is the founder of Coffee Republic, and our very own Andrew Wald, who is the Culture and Leadership Director here at BT. 
and we'll be talking about applying a startup mentality in your business. So don't delay, you can sign up via the link that's in the chat. So that's all we've got time for today. So thank you very much for joining and I hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.